uh, we will have um, question and answer. But before we move to today's proceedings, I want to begin with the land acknowledgement. And if I'm breathing heavy, it's my mask. <laughs> so I, I'd like to, um, uh, to offer you a land acknowledgement that I hope reflects on the lands from which those of us that are present here at York University today are speaking, and also the site at which Rebecca Hall's research took place. So those of us that are here in person today, present at York University, um, we are speaking to you here from Toronto, the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been cared for by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis, and it's currently home to many Indigenous peoples. And I want to acknowledge both the history and the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the, Cred the Credit First Nation. This territory, as we know, is subject to the dish with one spoon, wampum belt covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And I know we are all in different places, and I urge all of us to engage in like reflections, as well as to commit ourselves to decolonizing not only land, but knowledge systems and practices. As far as different places, uh, the different places that are implicated in this event, the research that Rebecca conducted for the book um, took place uh, on Dene land, and in conjunction with close partnerships, research partnerships with Northern Indigenous peoples, both of which we acknowledge here, specifically Chief Dragi's territory and the Moe Goa Denitli. Professor Hall's book is also a product of a partnership that she had with the Native Women's Association uh, of Northwest Territories and research participants who inform the thinking of the book uh, behind the book um, include Dene, Metis, and, and Inuit peoples. And today, um, Rebecca is a member of the Tlisho uh, Research Network, which is named We Will Not Be Banned from Our Land, an Indigenous research led an Indigenous led research community that has done much to enrich Rebecca's thinking on these projects and that of many of us here. So the book we're going to hear about today chronicles how, since the beginning of the 21st century, diamonds have driven economic development in the Canadian North, uh, in quotes. Um, while diamonds mined in Canada are assumed to be pure and assigned a very magical quality, as Rebecca writes, they're part of a deep and developed extractive structure that extends across Denny land and involves workers that participate in fly-in and fly-out activities that are often separated from their communities and households by time and space. And in this wonderful work, Rebecca adopts an expansive uh, decolonizing feminist approach to political economy, um, a lens that explores the effects of such extractive activities on people um, around Yellowknife Northwest Territories. And of course, she focuses in particular on the impact of diamond mining on Indigenous women's social reproductive labor at the mine sites and surrounding them and um, in adjacent communities and households. So we're gonna hear more about this extensive um, and rich ethnographic work from Rebecca. And um, we, were, um, we were to hear from um, uh, Angela Luke today, um, who is a professor here in the School of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies at York University and a member of the Big Stone Cree Nation in Treaty 8 territory, and who does wonderful research on political economy of oil and gas in Alberta, among other things. However, Michelle is ill today, and so she sends her regrets. Um, but I wanted to, to note that um, she sent a very lovely note to us this morning in which she says how disappointed she is um, that she's not going to be able to make it today. But um, to make it very um, clear and plain, she says, Oh, Rebecca, you have written such a lovely book and done amazing research into my favorite topics, and I plan to cite your text heavily in my two upcoming publications. So she wishes you well, and um, unfortunately, we won't hear from her today. Um, however, we will hear from um, uh, a wonderful commentator, Professor Veldin Coburn. Uh, Veldin Coburn is Anishinaabe and Algonquin from Pitawakatan. He is assistant professor at the University of Ottawa's Institute of Indigenous Research and Studies, and his research focuses on Canadian Indigenous politics, settler colonialism, post-colonial theory, and anti and decolonizing theories of society, 
state and power. We're very lucky to have Veldin here today. So before Veldin offers his remarks, though, we'll have Rebecca talk about the book. And um, so please join me in, in welcoming Rebecca here. Okay, sure. Thank you so much, uh, Leah. And, and I'd like to begin just by saying it's honestly just such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you to everyone who's here online. And thank you so much to those of you who made it here in person. Um, and, and also, as, as Leah said, I, uh, I express a huge amount of gratitude to my research partners, um, most of whom are in the Northwest Territories and uh, who have meant so much to me as, as friends and also as, uh, as collaborators. Um, and finally, I'd like to say thank Veldin, a wonderful colleague and friend who's agreed to, uh, to be our discussant today. So we'll start with, I'm going to give about a 10 minute, 10, maybe 15 minute, I'll try a 10 minute talk um, about the book, just outlining how I came to the research and uh, some of its key themes, and then I'll turn it over to Veldin, and then we'll have more of an informal conversation. Um, Oh my gosh, and before I, I do that, I, I also want to thank Leah, Leah Vosco, a wonderful mentor um, of mine for, for a long time, who's seen this research in all of its phases, uh, who invited me here today. So thank you so much, Leah. Um, so how I, I came to this work, uh, just to situate myself, uh, I am a white settler uh, with Irish and Scottish ancestry. I was raised in Ottawa. Um, but a long time ago, in my early 20s, I moved up to Yellowknife uh, for a job with the Native Women's Association. And while I was there, uh, I was a, a frontline support worker for people who had experienced violence. Um, and doing that work and, and hearing the stories of um, the women who were coming into my office made me think a lot about the gender of settler colonialism. Um, and uh, I decided to, to think about it in, in graduate school. So that's, that's what I came to do. And um, in particular, when I, when I wanted to do that work, I was interested in intervening in this idea, the individualization of social problems. At the time when I was doing that work, we were under the Harper administration. There was this idea that violence was a criminal activity that happened between two people and, and not the result of social issues. And so I wanted to intervene in that. And in particular, I was looking at I was interested in looking at gender violence as it relates to ongoing processes of settler colonial dispossession. Now, at the time that I was living in Yellowknife and, and to this day, uh, diamond mining was the major uh, extractive industry in the region. Um, and I found, I found the ubiquity of the presence of the diamond mines very striking. Uh, it was a relatively new commodity for Canada at the time. The first diamond mine opened in the Northwest Territories in 1998. And since then, uh, Canada had become the third largest diamond producer in the world. And regionally, the diamond mines were at the time and, and up until today, accounting for about 50% of the GDP, uh, sometimes a little bit less, but, but nevertheless, a huge portion of the GDP. And beyond the economics of it, you could, you could feel the presence of the diamond mines in the day-to-day -day lives of people in Northern communities in that it was a fly in fly out set of mines. So people would live in their home communities for two weeks at a time and then go to the mines for two weeks at a time. So this fly in fly out rhythm shaped the daily lives of the people that I was meeting. So in witnessing this, this presence and in recognizing that it was a relatively new presence, I wanted to think through the ways in which the industry was, extra, uh, was impacting gender relations. I wanted to trace the ties between the site of extractive work, which is hundreds of kilometers away from the communities, to the sites of caring work, social reproduction, and land-based relations and labors that were disrupted by this extractive regime. So that is what I set out to do. And uh, I'll just take you through a few of the themes that I came to in doing this work before, before turning it over to Veldem. So first of all, one of the things that, um, that I tried to do was problematize the idea of ethical Canadian extraction, as, as Leah mentioned in her introduction. And I looked at that from both a global political economic and a regional lens. So globally, um, in the book, I situate the local impacts of the subarctic mines within the unequal global political economy of diamond mines. So like I said, the diamond mines were first established in the late 90s. Um, for those of you uh, interested in the global, global political economy of diamonds, you'll know that this was around the time of the Kimberley process and a real interest on the part of Western states 
in conflict mining or so-called blood diamonds of the African continent. So there was this uproar around this notion of blood diamonds and Canada became the ethical alternative to that, right? Canada was very involved in the Kimberley process and then right at the same time developed a diamond industry of its own. So in the book, I talk about how Canada makes itself an ethical exception of the violence of extraction through mutually reinforcing branding of both the Canadian nation and its commodities. I problematize this north-south dichotomy that affords assumed morality to extraction in the global north by locating Canadian diamonds in the past and present context of settler colonial dispossession of Indigenous peoples and its inherent gendered violence. So in the book, I go through both uh, colonial continuities um, from past forms of extraction to the present, um, as well as relatively new forms of um, getting someone in here, as well as relatively new forms of uh, contemporary colonialism here. The book is very much influenced and, and grounded in Glenn Coltard's critique of the politics of recognition, which are certainly at play in the diamond industry. So, so one thing that's relatively novel about the diamond industry in relation to past extractive processes in Northern Canada is the intense efforts to recruit indigenous workers. And we see this both on the part of the Canadian state investing huge amounts of money into this work and also on the part of Canadian companies as well. And, and I argue that this is because in many ways uh, the Canadian state and these extractive companies have responded to and interpreted demands for greater attention to extractive affected communities with this sort of one magic solution and that's employment. And so it's sort of responsible development via employment, um, which, as I said, has, has resulted in, in really huge amounts of funding towards that. Um, so in the book, via interviews, I look at the impact of extractive employment on Indigenous mine workers, and especially Indigenous women working in the mines. But more than a focus on the mine itself, um, I expand the site of analysis to communities and to the homes of these workers that are in relation to the mines. And that's, and that's the second thing I'll talk about before turning it over. Um, it's that although the book is about extractive regimes, the center of the analysis is very much the social reproduction of Northern indigenous communities and, and asking questions like, how do mine workers reproduce themselves via the rhythm of fly in, fly out? How do families reproduce themselves when one person is away so much of the time? And how do communities that are committed to reproducing land-based relations do so in the face of an extractive regime that's very much antithetical to that sort of reproduction. And, and in asking those questions, what I found is that social reproduction emerged very much as a site of tension between the reproduction of land-based relations and between the diamond mining regime. And it meant that on the one hand, social reproduction was very much a site of violence. Um, in interviews, this was often what I would hear that and both you know, interpersonal and, and physical expressions of violence, but also social violence um, certainly were all expressed in relation to the ways in which social reproduction needed to shift to meet the demands of the diamond mining regime. But at the same time, social reproduction was very much a site of resistance. Um, it resisted the imperatives of the extractive regime insofar as people often privileged their social response social responsibilities over the demands of the diamond mining regime. And it was a site of resistance insofar as people saw social reproduction as something related to the community and related to the land and not necessarily related to supporting workers at the extractive regime. What am I doing for time here? Am I, I'm okay? All right. Um, so, so what the book is, um, I'll show you the book. Here it is, that's the book. Um, so the book is, uh, is structured through the relationships between these labors, social reproduction, extractive labors, and then also land-based labors. And uh, I, I look at these labors as they're expressed through the stories of research participants. And, and taken together, I argue that concretely, the diamond mining regime has brought new pressures upon the Northern mixed economy in and around Yellowknife. The diamond mining regime is structured through a settler ideology that masculinizes capitalist production, feminizes and naturalizes social reproduction, and obscures subsistence and relations to land altogether. 
As a result, the diamond mining regime has created barriers to the social reproduction of indigenous modes of life. But I suggest that in expanding our approach to how we understand extractive labor and to look at the labor at the mine site in relation to both the caring labors that happen at the site itself and also uh, within communities, indigenous women's decolonizing labor is made more visible. So in the face of the pressures of the diamond mining regime, research participants reported that they successfully carved out the space to socially reproduce their communities and to protect and nurture relations to the land. It's these day-to-day -day labors that are difficult and sometimes targeted by violence that resist the totalizing impulses of settler capitalism and reproduce distinct modes of life in the Northern mixed economy. And just to close off, if, uh, if you'll indulge me, I'm just gonna read a short quote, not my own words, but the words of uh, a Dene woman who participated in this research. She talked about the imperatives of privileging social reproductions and privileging relations to land. And she wrote, or she said, you have a table, you have a chair, you can replace that, but not human beings. When you have a relationship with your wife or your husband or your children, it's hard to replace that. You know, I hope somebody's listening to this. They can replace a lamp, their wood or that, and diamond mines, it's just a piece of stone. I think as human beings, we're worth it to each other. And that's important. You can't replace that. And I will, I will leave it there and I'll, I'll turn it over to Veldon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, it is my honor, actually, to- Oh, Veldon, we can't hear you. Or, or can others okay. hear Veldon? Everyone else can hear me but you. Can you hear me, Rebecca? You can hear me now? All right, great. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for having me join. Uh, I've known Rebecca for a couple of years now. We've written um, several pieces together now, and, and she's even contributed work to my own book that was that I edited this past year with a colleague of ours, uh, Dave Thomas at Mount Allison on capitalism and dispossession. Um, so I, I've known this work for quite a while, and um, you know, just to, I'll get into something substantive, but th like the symbolism of the title itself, when I first got it, I really kind of wanted to understand it. And um, I think it might be lost on people, but the uh, the refracted idea of the refracted e economies is that in, I guess, our own sort of Western epistemology is how we understand our, our nature of our existence is that we might just have subject and object and how do we relate to the objects of our commodities and, and Marx was really much interested in saying like commodities restructure our social relations with one another and with that and with our, our, our own work that produces it. So it's when you're shot through a prism and maybe I'm reading too much into into the artsiness of it is that you can see the constituent parts of something that seems really unidimensional just like mono dimensional just one dimension. Um, but there is this unique relationship with uh, these Western luxury co commodities. It, it, it does in many ways mediate the colonialism. Uh, so there's a, there's a number of points because Rebecca's book does does more than I ever thought it would. I, I hadn't read it uh, before and I should have, but I, no, I've read it now already. Don't worry. Um, but uh, uh, it, I was just getting around to it and, uh, and I read it and I thought, okay, well, uh, I know her work and I know some of her research, but I didn't know that she went and weaved all these different disparate things together. And it's not that they're disparate in the sense that they're so far discrete that they're unrelatable and it's an unmanageable project. It's just she, she does it quite masterfully in this. And um, so one of the points that I like in the theoretical part is about labor. So um, I, you know, and I don't even know about Rebecca's own politics and whether she's a Marxist, but the, the Marxist critique of, of capital and labor is still uh, quite germane. And uh, although I might not say I'm Marxist, but I do apply that kind of lens to a lot of, um, of my own work because 
it's quite relevant in today's with the deepening inequality and the mass accumulation of capital at the expense of labor. So what framework uh, is, is, I know, most developed, um, but it's especially the, um, the philosophical work of like the refractedness that Marx says is like, uh, a lot of people view him as more of a, sometimes a technical political economist is doing some of the theoretical work of it, but without the ph philosophy, but other people who read it for the philosophy can see sort of what I'm getting at in the refracted economies is that um, it's it's much more dense and nuanced. And, and then we have those refracted parts that shoot through the prism, here being the diamond, the literal, you know, um, I guess prism that would break apart uh, the uh, constituents, I guess, wavelengths of light into their different parts. And we have um, the theoretical examination of the different labors that capitalism seems to be very parasitic upon. And Marx picks up on it, but I don't think, and this is the only time I've ever seen it, I've heard, seen allusions to it, and um, uh, and I've thought about it. I'm, uh, my interest is, is long been in labor. My background before political science, political theory is labor economics. And uh, to understand as uh, there's something more going on in colonial uh, labor relations, like the social relations, and one day somebody will get around to really doing it. And uh, so there's both the theory, which is exceptional because we Marx does allude to say it almost in a way that um, in these non-capitalist areas of our everyday work which is, well, philosophically speaking, like our, our, our living labor or what have you, the activities that we do, it is, um, you know, typically it, it subsidizes capitalism because like our works, when we go home at the end of the day to subside, it is to regenerate our bodies for capitalism to go to work and um, e exploit the surpluses of our physical labor anyway. So we're running ourselves down, but then we have to go back home to work and then that's you know there's also the other and and very gender divided um modes of of um i guess reproducing the replenished labor that will be fed back into the circuits of capital the you know in in every sort of um cycle like it could be daily or whatnot and it's the caring labors as well so um these fly in fly out communities they sustain I guess a, uh, I guess, you know, a, a margin, marginally more healthier uh, supply of labor, and, and in many ways too is the other work that she's done in the past is um, the the violence that's visited upon indigenous populations, especially women, by these fly in fly outs. Um, I guess, and you. I mean, it's the very temporary aspect of the extraction that goes in is it, it also extracts that. So it alienates that from uh, the women themselves who in many ways service without remuneration for the product of capital. So there is this drain is, I mean, um, a lot of um, social political thought or political economy understands there's the, you know, global north and global south dichotomy, but here, uh, and I think uh, Rebecca alluded to it as well, is that it creates that same sort of dynamic in Canada to these, uh, what you might think is like the periphery, you're out there uh, far from the metropole where the centers of finance and capital accumulation want to siphon off the wealth from these distant places. And they're also siphoning off, I guess, the moral, sort of moral worth, because there is that alienation in, of, that Marx points to, the alienation of the product of their labor. Uh, and for this point, it's, it's not even remunerated. So it goes unpaid um, and uh, all for the commodity luxury life of those in the global south and not, not, not just to mention as well as the, um, the dispossession of surplus value from labor but also the capitals and and in this case it's it's literally a you know a, a diamond so it's it's taken out it's not just made it's not, not just financialized although commodities are often uh i guess used to uh support the circuits of liquid finance markets these days and i wanted to get a little bit more to the sort of accumulation and 
Rebecca had contributed work to a previous book that came out this spring on, and we went back and we sort of um, were looking at the more capital aspect rather than the labor is the ongoing repackaging. And this gets to the sort of responsibility, respectability, and the ethics of the product of, of uh, this colonial capitalism is the under the guise of ethical products and and i and i recall some corners and there i think there's like a website out there um for the canadian association of petroleum producers of the ethical oil is to position themselves as a good and therefore master disguises the violence behind primitive accumulation and that being the the moment of the transition from uh communally held uh, resources, mostly in what Marx had called nature's gift, or at least, you know, in the drooling sort of uh, ravished and rabid eyes of the capitalist, is to pillage. And in this case, it comes at the expense of Indigenous people. So there's a little bit of the, the enclosure of the commons here, shuttle off the peasants from the land, from their commons, privatize it, put it into the hands of uh, corporations, so the large corporations here, and there's, you know, almost a near global monopoly with the beers and a few competitors or whatnot. But uh, here they contrast it for the feel good, uh, I guess, shine that we could put on in the thin veneer of uh, nice, kinder, gentler colonialism in Canada is that, well, we go up there and we bring jobs to them. We do, we have scuttled them from their territory. We've left them with their small reserves um, and um, we're doing stuff very responsibly. We give ourselves social license to do what would be otherwise bad things. And this stands in sharp contrast with the conflict diamonds or blood diamonds in Africa. However, uh, and, and, and I think uh, Rebecca does caution the reader here is like she does not want to minimize the, the horrors and atrocities that are conducted over and like say Sierra Leone, for example, where there is enslavement still. Um, uh, and, and basically, yeah, so slavery to extract those, but um, here it is the ongoing theft of labor and territory of the indigenous peoples. And um, stigmatizes again, still still upholds the sort of stigma against indigenous activities as without value, um, they're unproductive or, or useless. However, it does um, it does get sapped into the circuits of, of capital extraction. So in the I guess in the abstract Marxist view of the alienation of oneself and the production of it, it is the global south or the centers of, of capital accumulation or control where they have the luxury to to fly in and oftentimes with their own sort of proletariat to go there that needs to partner or needs um, to parasitically live off the indigenous uh, economy up there, even if it's the sort of non-capitalist work or what have you, and um, siphon off that wealth as well. So, um, for, for yeah, I mean, I could, I could like, uh, we'll, I don't know what I can say. I, I mean, I could talk about this book for, for a very long time. Be, and, um, uh, that's, I think, I, I think that's a lot what I was interested in and I hope we can have a discussion of it, but, um, yeah, there is the, the sort of dishonesty of Canada's being responsible in its, extractive activities because it's no less violent than the initial moment of the sort of like the hypothetical mythical moment of the transition to capitalism where people are dispossessed of their goods and their uh i guess social position and having their lives restructured that being taken and transferred by the power of the state into the hands of private capital um in in the and it doesn't really it's not really vulgar to say but more in more vulgar terms that's that's what we know as theft um so it's uh it's the kinder gentler colonialism that uh that we see it's you know that that diamond 
sitting on someone's finger or in their earrings. And when you look a little bit closer, you see the constituent parts, as I said, um, that um, Rebecca does a masterful job of bringing to light. So I hope those are good over an overview and um, some initial remarks for the discussion. So. Thank you so much, Belden, uh, for those those really wonderful comments. Yes, clapping here. You can't hear, but <laughs> there we go. Thanks so much, Belden. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, as you talked about theft, um, I thought a little bit about who's in the audience and I and um, what people study. And I, I don't know if she's still here, but at some point I noticed Suzanne Mills. Are you still here, Suzanne? Oh, yeah, she's here. Yeah. I think you are. Uh, one of the things that that um, Rebecca has yet to talk about is this whole question about and and um, the kinder so-called kinder gentler approach that Belden um, spoke of and that that um, Rebecca critiques and Belden critiqued alongside her around um, the diamond industry's focus on hiring indigenous workers and how that in its assimilationist um, mode um, uh, fits in with this larger uh, set of questions uh, and also just the the way in which Rebecca talks a little bit and has today about the the existence of the northern mixed economy and what that really means, in contrast to say, um, the um, differently horrible situation in Sierra Leone and elsewhere. So I don't know if you want to make a few comments about um, uh, Belden's remarks and those of others, and then we'll have some interchange. If people want to, I don't know, raise their hands, I can try to take a, a speaker's list. <laughs> Yeah, that, that sounds great. I, I can start just by responding to what you just said, sure, Leah, and also to, um, to to Veldin's comments, um, which were just so, so wonderfully insightful. I'm not surprised at all. Thank you, Veldin. Um, I, um, yeah, a thing that comes to my mind is I, I really like the way you were talking about this sort of facade of, of, of kinder, gentler um, capitalist dispossession that um, obscures the ongoing processes of primitive accumulation. And I think I think we really do see that in um, the ways in which uh, attempts to hire indigenous workers are sort of seen as this responsible development mode. And, and there's a few things maybe just to add to that. Um, first of all, it's interesting that it's seen as a kindness because um, for, on the part of the Canadian state and on the part of the, the diamond companies, hiring indigenous workers is a wonderful kindness to them. It's a gift to them because they're getting workers who are local. So it's easier to transport them to the mines. And there are also workers uh, who know the land, who have knowledge and expertise of the land and are better able to, to do the labor that they're asked of uh, or that are, that's asked of them. Um, but then it gets sort of gets turned around and these people are imagined as, as unemployed. Um, right, so instead of seeing these processes of dispossession that disrupt the mixed economy, what we see instead is the sort of imagined um, lack of work. And you know, there's no lack of work. And and not only are are a lot of lots of the people working in the mines engaged in other sorts of labor, so engaged in social reproduction and land-based labors. Um, just anecdotally, in a lot of the interviews that I did with mine workers um, and their families. They sort of said it's often our, our, our best and our brightest that get recruited to work at the mines. So it's folks who already have jobs in the community or jobs elsewhere who are then going to work in the mines um, rather than people who aren't already engaged in some form of wage labor. And, and I do want to be clear, you know, I, I think in making this critique, I, I don't want to discount the fact that plenty of the people that I spoke to were happy to have worked in the mines in some capacity. So on individual bases, like often there was, um, there were benefits that were accrued from working in the mines, but on a more systemic level, on a community level, that's where we saw this, this disruption. Do we have um, interventions from the audience? I would just add really quickly to um, when, when you talked about the social respectability as well. And this, um, we're very technologically challenged <laughs> and it is incredibly, <laughs> right i just want to see if anybody has a comment they want to make if somebody has a comment perhaps they could raise their hand so i can see it or if anybody in the room there is a room by the way oh vanita claire so i will mute vanita 
Hi there, are you able to hear us? Perfect. Um, thanks for the, the great remarks thus far. Um, really, really appreciate that and, and all of your uh, wonderful insight on your book. Uh, I myself am a third year PhD student uh, at U of T in political science and my own research is looking at gender-based violence and resource extraction industries. Um, but I more so look at oil um, and pipelines. So I was just kind of wondering um, from perhaps maybe a little bit of a selfish note, um, how did you land on kind of the case selection and perhaps the type of resource that you were interested in? In this case, it would be, you know, diamonds. Um, and do you perhaps anticipate or could you see perhaps some of your findings also being applied to other uh, modes of extraction or other resources? Thanks, Benita. Um, so I'd say to, I, I came to the case study largely um, through, through personal means because I had been living and working in Yellowknife and, and the, the diamond industry was by far the dominant uh, extractive industry in the Northwest Territories. Um, and, but then I think the other thing that drew me to um, studying the diamond mines was that um, they were relatively novel. As I said, the, the first one had opened in the late 90s. So to me, it was, um, you know, Canada has this, this very long, entangled, extractive history. And um, for very good reasons, it can be hard to parse out the impacts of different sets of processes because they are so deeply intertwined. But I thought the diamond mines, and especially because, as Veldin said, they were really attempting to position themselves as this ethical alternative. To me, they offered a really interesting and discrete contemporary case study into thinking about ongoing processes of dispossession and how they've perhaps shifted in, in recent years. Um, but certainly, I think you know there's there's lots of links to be made, um, and uh, and in more more recent years since. Um, since doing this work, I have um, worked with colleagues who are in uh, whose research is in the oil and gas industry, and certainly the I mean the continuities are are very apparent. Okay, I have uh, Kosku Felic and then Leslin. Hello. Uh, oh, thank you. We have to mute ourselves. Okay. Uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to read your book yet, but I will read it as soon as possible. Uh, but I have a question. Uh, you say, and a very uh, related question to the previous one. Uh, you use two uh, different terms, diamond mining regime and extractive regime uh, during your presentation. So uh, do you see anything specific about the uh, social reproduction regime and also labor regime in diamond mining, which cannot be seen in uh, gold mining, coal mining, et cetera. And I also work on uh, the social reproduction regimes in coal mining regions. That's why I'm asking this question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's a great question. Um, so I would say um, a few things that are um, perhaps unique and maybe not just to diamond mines, but some of the distinguishing characteristics of the diamond mines as they operate in the Northwest Territories is that diamond mining um, is very expensive and very technologically intensive. So compared to other minerals that had been in, um, extracted previously. So for example, in the Northwest Territories, um, many of the, the settler towns were rooted around gold mines and the gold mines were right beside where the settlers were living um, and much closer to the day-to-day -day lives that the people had. The diamond mines were far, far away. They're very deep mines. Um, they're hard to get to. And, and so I think that is, is one of very much the distinguishing characteristics in that the work lives and the home lives were so very separated as a result of the diamond industry. And then I think um, another thing that distinguishes it, actually going back to Vanita's question, um, from other industries like oil and gas is that it's a luxury commodity. So this would be like, like gold, um, but it means that there's a particular imperative for this kind of, this purifying uh, work that is done, that's done, you know, rhetorically, um, because while people can make the argument that, you know, and they, they do make the argument that oil and gas is, integral to our day-to-day -day lives, it's very different when it comes to diamonds, right? Um, and so I think that's that's one of the reasons why that 
that ethical imperative was front and center when it came to the ways in which the diamond mines were established. Leslin. Uh, thank you for, so much. And um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, I haven't yet uh, read the book, um, but I was so interested when I saw the topic and I'm like, this is the topic that I'm actually uh, working on for my dissertation. Uh, but for me, I'm looking at um, extractive industry. Um, so my case study is uh, Zimbabwe. Um, and I was saying to myself, I really need to be careful not to have a bias because that's where I come from. And it's almost like uh, closer to home. Um, so um, it was very interesting how, um, uh, you know, you, you were mentioning, and then uh, Veldon was also mentioning about, you know, the displacement, um, you know, dispossession, and how um, it's, it's like, it's so much alike, you know, like people just being moved from their land. And um, most of the time, they don't care where they end up living. So now again, you know, uh, when I look on the gender aspect as, you know, women as keepers of the land and the ones who feed the, the, you know, the families. Now, if they get dispossessed of their land, how are they going to survive? So the resultant thing that we are seeing there is um, either a lot of, you know, robberies, a lot of prostitution, you know, because people need to um, survive. And I also um, noted as well uh, what uh, Veldon uh, mentioned, the uh, like labor being alienated to the product, because you find most of these people that work in these mines, um, they cannot even afford to buy a diamond ring for their wives, you know, um, but they are the ones who are, you know, in harm's way and um, overworking and underpaid. And like in the case of Zimbabwe, we see a lot of labor abuse where the, the, the labor is actually, they get beaten up, they get guns pointed at them, you know, when they're working. So. It's, it's such a similar thing. I, um, I'm very interested in uh, the topic and I'll, I'll really make sure that I read your book. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. And thank you, Veldon. Veldon, you wanted to jump in. Yes. Um, so there was, there was a, a point that Rebecca makes and I don't know if I made it at all to, I, I mentioned a little bit to, but uh, Rebecca alludes to something that um, you know, in reading this, you, you probably can't avoid thinking about Gramsci as well, is the processes here um, manufacture or produce consent of the indigenous peoples, especially with when you when you read Rebecca's analysis of the really sort of opportunistic modes that both the state and corporations use to draw in uh, direct labor inputs from the indigenous peoples themselves and and um, to get that social license for the respectability of it is um, there's the Rebecca points out into the top of page 114 if you have the books um, indigenous poverty is framed not as a result of col uh, settler colonialism but as a social problem to be fixed through employment and state benevolence and thus extractive employment and especially diamond mine employment has emerged as the main development strategy employed by the territorial and federal government in regards to these indigenous communities. So they suspended them in the states of deprivation such that really the only escape from it, um, not really, uh, you know, because they've denigrated and, and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of coercive constraints on them practicing their own non-capitalist labors as well. So uh, non-indigenous, she talks about like the, the different um, modes of uh, the economy here being, you know, mixed, but still, uh, pointing out the subordination of indigenous activities to capitalism, but here is where the the mine gets its its you know its consent to basically steal from indigenous peoples and extract from their territory by having people say, well, we're willful workers. And uh, just before the other two common or three, I guess were mentioned um, a few things moments ago here. Rebecca had stated something as well. Well, I mean, yes, we can't look down our noses at Indigenous peoples who are taking these jobs, but sort of in the same way that John Stuart Mill might say, well, it's kind of the the peasants' consent is that it's not actual real consent when they have no viable practical alternative. 
Um, you also see up there, and I know someone who lives up in that region who parks Canada through some, um, I think uh, it's, it's federal legislation is uh, harvesting their own medicines for uh, their own activities is they outlaw that activity and thus you're really only left with the choice of entering into uh, the labor market or the labor forces, the proletariat to sell your labor to these people because the alternative is um, extreme poverty for them. Um, so yeah, like these insights, like this is some of the really good stuff of the book. Um, and um, again, when I'm, I'm reading and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm a little bit of Gramsci here of, you know, the manufacture of the consent of indigenous peoples to uh, a colonial deprivation. So, and especially to make it feel as if it is their own choice of entering into, into labor, into employment to say like, this is really the, the moral activity of my, my livelihood. Um, we're becoming more advanced because of the cultural production of the stigma attached to look at the non-valuable activity you guys do as, as indigenous primitives or something like that come into the real world and um, yeah. If I could, um, I usually agree with Feldon and, and I do agree with Feldon on this. Rebecca does an excellent job in, in looking at the coercive nature of the extractive industries and, um, and how, and that's why I mentioned Suzanne's work a little bit. Um, they they really capitalize on hiring indigenous workers and making it impossible through limiting certain kinds of um, uh, activities from hunting and fishing to, as you point out, medicine and such. On the other hand, Rebecca um, is a glasses half full person, and so were her research. Through the, through, so were the people that participated in her research. And so maybe when you respond to to Veldin, you could also talk a little bit about how the northern how resistance operates in the northern mixed economy and the relationship between, in particular, that you do such a beautiful job of, I feel, uh, the relationship between indigenous subsistence economies and the extractive economy. Because in this book, this book is really alive to people's um, people's responses to things that are not of their own choosing, indigenous people's responses to things that are not of their own choosing. And I, I think it's important to highlight that as well, if you, if you will. Yes, yeah, thank you. Feldon and, and Leah and uh, and that is that is something that I was thinking about is you know Feldon brought up um, manufactured consent which which I so appreciate and to me something that really struck out or struck me in the in the interviews or that stood out was um, so I did a number of interviews uh, with management of these these different diamond mines and often when I asked them about challenges when it came to labor and employment the big challenge they would say is like well it's really hard to recruit and it's really hard to retain. Um, and this was very much seen as a sort of a failure on the part of um, the extractive industry, this like nut that they needed to crack. Um, but then often when I was um, interviewing either uh, former workers of the diamond mine or family members of the diamond mines, people would speak with, with quite a bit of pride um, around their employment choices. And, and they would see themselves as resisting the kind of the the pull of the extractive regime when they chose to, uh, oftentimes they would talk about, you know, maybe I worked at the diamond mine for a few years when I was younger, I needed to make some money. But then once I was 20, I was able to leave. And now I do this job um, that's sort of much more in line with my values or that allows me to be home with my family um, or that allows me to spend more time on the land. And, and sometimes um, they would talk about how they would never have taken a job in the diamond mine and they'd always, although they knew they could have made way more money at the diamond mines, they chose to stay within their community and, and do work that, that aligned with their values. And to me, that was this really ever-present form of, of everyday resistance that was going on. And, um, and it, was, it was tied to commitments to the land and it was tied to commitments to community. And, and it was also very much tied to, you know, feminized labors of, of care. Um, and not just the care of immediate kin, so care of children, your own children for sure, but also care of nieces and nephews and aunties and uncles and elders. Um, I remember a few interviews where people said, um, you know, I, I, again, worked at a diamond mine for a while, but I realized I couldn't be there for my nephew um, who's, who's often sick. And so I, I stopped doing that work. And, uh, and again, often a real sense of pride associated with, with those commitments.
That's not hand, but now maybe I have it. Oh, Karen. Oh, yeah. I'll just I'll mute myself. Hi, Rebecca. So great to see this amazing work. Um, I was thinking, I've been thinking um, so much about, as I listen to you speak, and I'm going to read the book I haven't yet, um, about Janie Cross's uh, book. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's basically a book about India in India, and it's about diamond workers. And uh, it's called Green Zones. Anyway, I guess the thing, you know, I think the, the thing that really strikes me about the, 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 the commonalities between what you are talking about and what I've read in his book is he really makes this argument that um, people are re required to do this whole level of aspirational labor. It's like a, it's like there's all this hope tied up with this, um, with this, uh, with these jobs because they, on one level, seem to be really pretty decent jobs. But actually, when you get into the uh, when you get into the long term impact and, you know, he explores the health and safety impacts and those they're actually terrible jobs. So I, I just I was just wondering whether you heard about that kind of aspirational labor in conjunction with, um, I guess, the other thing that, you know, that uh, Jamie Cross's book really reveals is how disappointing it then is that this is actually not, um, you know, that that people are not, in fact, um, bought like this is not the solution to the economic crises that the community he's focusing on you know uh, faces actually and you know so yeah i just was wondering if you had any um any reflections or connections that you saw with with that work thank you karen and it's so nice to see you um thanks for coming to this uh yeah so i i hadn't heard um the term used in that way, but I think it's it's um, it's really fitting. And and what um, what your comments made me think of um, right away is is the kind of the gender of aspiration um, when it comes to the diamond mines. And you know, all all extractive work is masculinized for sure, but the the fly in fly out um, nature of it intensifies that because it tended to be often the women I spoke to who had worked at the mines had done so for really short stints. Whereas the men saw themselves as making a career out of it because um, they didn't stop for caring laborers in the same way. Um, and so some of the men that I spoke to really did, did talk about that aspirational side of it. And often they talked about how they were, you know, some of them um, were kind of seen as, as bright lights. And so were uh, encouraged, you know, do extra training, take on leadership positions. Um, there are actually mandated positions in all the communities that have agreements with the mines. Uh, for community members who are sort of representatives of the company within the community. So that was sort of another way in which people would take on leadership roles. And, and there was real ambivalence around those roles. You know, I think um, some of the people I've spoken to felt a great deal of pride for the way that they've made long careers for themselves in the mines, but many of them had, and, and this is another a thing I don't talk about so much in the book is that the diamond industry is really contracting so a lot of them had actually left the Northwest Territories and gone on to work in Alberta um, mostly actually um, as they saw the jobs starting to diminish so on the one hand they did feel this pride but there was sort of a sense of giving up on things to be able to provide for their children so not necessarily feeling a lot of meaning in the work but feeling that they'd able been able to you know provide a, a steady income for their kids um, whereas and this is not across the board, there were some examples of women who I spoke to who had similar experiences, but more often the women who I spoke to were doing more precarious, um, lower status forms of labor at the mines, often housekeeping. Um, and those sorts of jobs did not exist on that aspirational plane. Um, you know, it was very much seen, uh, it was subcontracted, they, there was no continuity in the work that they had, and there wasn't really a, a place to go to from there. And they often talked about feeling very high levels of of disrespect and and sometimes lack of safety at the mine site. So so a real divide there. Are there other comments or questions people or reflections people would like to share? Any questions from the room? <laughs> <laughs> we do have a room. I think Suzanne has a question. Yes, oh, Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> Let me just I mean, this just relates to work that I've done recently. Um, 
I think he did a good job of showing like in the book the resistance as well as um potentially kind of what we might term a victim approach or whatnot and kind of trying to balance those two things I'm wondering if there's any room for something in between for kind of ambivalence or for people um I know I have a PhD student right now who's been working with the Satu Renewable Resource Board and trying to get people in um in Talita and Norman Wells's perspectives on um on development perspective on development and there's like a wide variety of different perspectives that like that people have right in in um Dene communities so that's not necessarily one or the other so I'm just wondering if you found any of that in your work um yeah I guess that would be what I'd say but congrats on the book it's a great book thanks Suzanne uh be okay there and I think I missed the very beginning of your question but I think I think I've got the gist of it and um yeah, I think that that ambivalence is is such a great question, and I think um, for sure the the gendered violences on the resistance side came out um, quite strongly in the book. I think in part because of the partnerships that I had. You know, I was working through this community history of um, working with the Native Women's Association and working with survivors of gender violence, so that you know that was the strongest voice that came out. Um, but I think that, and you know, there's been, uh, you mentioned having a student uh, working in the Saatchi region. I think there's been wonderful work coming out of the Saatchi region about the ways in which communities harness, um, you know, extractive employment and, and harness the resources that they garner from extractive employment to pursue the mixed economy and to pursue the work, the land-based work that they want to continue doing. And, uh, and I think that's a really important story to tell. And it's certainly like in the book, it's it's not the dominant story, but I did try to sort of hold that as well. Um, and I think now, so uh, since completing the book, most of my work has been around mine closure and it's provided a really interesting insight into the ways in which different communities have used the community level resources that have come from the diamond industry. And it's not enough. And I, I critique in the book how little uh, communities get um, from the diamond industry, but it is something. They do get some um, some revenue. So they've been using those revenues, a number of communities for education activities in the community, for on the land activities um, and that sort of thing. And so now these communities are faced with the problem of um, figuring out how to continue their, their social provisioning when they know they're gonna be losing those diamond resources. So so that piece as well, I think speaks to the ambivalence that, that communities have to this this process of ongoing dispossession, but one that in the very immediate has provided these resources that they've come to use for their own community reproduction. Can you talk about the Bush School here and what people said about those kind of things? The, yeah, so I, um, my other sort of book, book talk was um, addition to Bush School, which is this wonderful Bush School um, in the Northwest Territories that, uh, that centers indigenous knowledge um, and, and especially especially Dene knowledge. And um, yeah, there was a lot of talk at that launch about the ways in which, um, I guess a few things to say there. For one is the ways in which uh, institutional resources and resources from a very temporary, like temporary regime, like the diamond mining regime can be used to start creating something different and you know, creating something that is indigenous led that is rooted in relationships to the land um, and that is, you know, I, the word that was used mostly at that launch was that is healing. Um, so that was that was sort of where our our post talk discussion went at, at that launch. Are there further questions or comments? Either online, I'm having trouble with this here, or elsewhere. Bill, did you want to have any any last words? Um, I I don't know. I don't think so. I think I'm. Um, well, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'll mention just because of my own interest here, um, having seen some of the effects and um, just right up close. So I had once visited. At Wapscat, for example, and spent a week up there and just to see because of the De Beers Victor mining, Victor mine, pretty close. They have an impact benefit agreement, and um, Rebecca explores those within here. Is like how do those transform the economy as well? 
and having been to Attawapiskat, I was interested to see this because it's in a different location. But um, I mean, the results are fairly generalizable as like a social science perspective. It's like, how can we understand what these corporations are doing generally uh, with the particulars being different in each specific case? But um, De Beers, for instance, in, in Attawapiskat, or at least they're 90 kilometers away and they have their community impact benefit agreement is just still to see a community in, um, in, in, in poverty as well and, and deprivation is this corporation, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I might have some dogs barking, but um, somebody rang the doorbell. Um, uh, so it was, it was interesting to see what, what occurs there, knowing what I did about, say, Attawapiskat, for example, which isn't, you know, as far away as, as it is. But um, one of the ideas of it being that sort of north the, or the global north, south or that um, uh, metropole and periphery perspective that you might have is that it's in far off places out of sight, out of mind, where some of the same uh, violences are transpiring against Indigenous peoples. And still leaving them, um, you know, and despite some sentiment where they they do feel a bit empowered, um, and despite, and you know, you mentioned some of the uh, responses from your talking circles that you had. There is the one epigraph on one of the ch the chapters like that. It stood out for me is like uh, from from I don't know if it's Doris. It says dimes are said to be a girl's best friend. I'm not sure which girls they are because it's certainly not anyone in here uh, talking about the way, I, I guess, just the, um, I mean, part of the cultural interpretation. So a bit of the signification of, or like of these materially signified commodities of luxury, which bring no material benefit to indigenous peoples in these locales. So it's, um, um, yeah, no, I, I didn't disagree at all with what you'd said, Leah, about, well, you know, I'm not sneering and looking down my nose at Indigenous peoples who take take up these jobs because that's, you know, part of the matter of, of um, the cultural production of, of pride and certain subjectivities as well. So uh, I make no moral judgment on any of my, uh, you know, Indigenous friends or family who say, you know, I'm unabashedly capitalist because, well, they're trained to be that as, as much. Um, so, uh, again, that's really the, um, the culture of consent that's produced by, um, you know, even through, through the state, like they shore up, uh, the efforts of, uh, organized capital to bring some of these training programs. Rebecca, you do talk about those in the book, um, is to orient them away from other options and to, to believe it. So, yeah, um, Previously, before this, we were talking about how does Canadian colonialism cover up the lies of capitalism, and this is kind of one of the ways. So, but I also, yeah, no, I understand like part of, like it's not just like they are uh, individual subjects without agency, and that they're just produced by these cultural discourses of, well, this job is better than what you're doing as as a you know as an indigenous person in your primitive setting of the you know forest being and forest dwelling. Uh, sitting in your rucksack in a in a teepee, you can have all the modern conveniences. Should you adopt this idea of a career and all the best that you can, you're an improvable individual, and therefore, um, uh, and this is what we bring for you, and and um, you should be you should be very proud of this. But um, but no, those are just a few sentiments that I had thinking about my time in in Attawapiskat and what I got from this is. To understand the things that um, I don't don't know about it really so yeah thanks thanks Val. Th thanks Val I I was more thinking that we we're both this is sort of the point of the refracted point that that in fact there is this um, complex production and reproduction um, that Rebecca's work is pointing to and the, the the complex ways in which people try to manage these contradictions for certain I think Chris Bailey has a a comment. Um, yeah, I have a question, actually. Um, I know you, you kind of mentioned this before, and congrats, Rebecca, on your new book. And I guess the short answer will be maybe read the book, Chris. <laughs> but I was wondering um, if you could elaborate on 
what you were just saying about that school um and i forget the name but um uh in terms of like how collective resistance or forms of collective resistance are happening um around uh, diamond mining and in particular when the mine leaves like what's left over and what new directions might be taken up that are maybe more you know toward a maybe like a green shift or a decolonizing shift away from from the extractive uh, colonial economy um and what that looks like because like with remediation like i remember <laughs> reading something you've written in the past or we were talking about it i think at one point where you know you'd, you'd have like a diamond mine started at the bottom of a lake so the entire lake is drained all the fish are gone all the caribou who rely on the lake are gone so how do you pick up the pieces after that and you know deal with the problems of social provisioning uh and the lack of funding around it i mean that's a big question i'm wondering how uh how people are starting to kind of uh reassemble their lives after uh, a mine like that upends everything and then leaves Thank you, Chris. And I, I will say more than just go read the book, <laughs> um, of course. And thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, I guess there's there's a few different levels or, or different scales that I, I want to answer that on. So the first thing is, um, so as Leah mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I'm part of this research network um, called We Will Not Be Banned From Our Land um, that's run out of the Clicho Dene government. And those questions are, are front of mind for for that particular First Nation um, and also for, for other First Nations um, in the Northwest Territories. And they're sort of seeing um, mine closure is such an interesting time because it sort of, it gets brushed under the rug. Like we don't hear about mine closure a whole lot. You certainly don't hear about mine closure the way you hear about mine opening. Um, but it is this moment, um, it's sort of this, this possible opening um, for communities that have felt that, that heavy weight of um, you know, a mine. Um, being on their land for for a long time, and so the the folks that I'm working with um, are thinking a lot about how they can restructure um, both their their community relations um, and also their their settler government, First Nation government relations, um, basically to make sure that there's not a simple reproduction um, of the of, of the kind of extractive political economy in northern Canada, which is certainly what would happen um, if there wasn't kind of concrete and activist action. Um, so it's happening at the governmental level, like the First Nations government level uh, in the Northwest Territories, and then it's also happening a lot in more grassroots um, ways. So I mentioned uh, the Bush University Deshinta, um, which has a really strong Indigenous youth component. Um, and they're associated with a few different um, indigenous youth organizations that aren't affiliated with one particular community or one particular particular First Nation, but are rather like pan-territorial um, that are really fighting for, for commitments to land-based economies, uh, land-based relations, and, and moving away from, from extraction. So those are those are some of the things that I've been noticing. Okay, I think. Oh, Elena, please. Hi, um, Rebecca, congratulations on your book. And I've been learning so much um, from Rebecca's work. Um, I guess my question is this um, around the concept of mixed economy and the extent to which mixed economy as a concept can be useful and transferable to other contexts, um, whether settler colonial as well or not. Um, and I guess, maybe if you could speak a little bit more um, about the kind of what Valden mentioned earlier, that there's still this subordination of subsistence um, labors to capitalist kind of um, production for profit, um, but yet not a full subsumption, um, a kind of continuously challenged through subsistence labors. Um, yeah, so can this concept be used outside of this particular context? Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elena. It's so nice to see you. Um, and and yes, thank you for asking about the mixed economy. Um, and I think so as a concept, you know, it's it's referring to the ways in which um, or the way I refer to it in the book is the ways in which um, indigenous land based economies and, and I, I mostly draw on the term not economies, but mode of life, which is Glenn Coltart's term because it's more than 
just economic activity. It's, it's a way of relating to the land and um, the ways in which those mix with um, settler imposed capitalist economy. And so I, I look at it as a regional formation. And I think one, one thing I, I try to do in the book um, is you know, speaking to the um, Canadian political economy literature that tends to acknowledge the mixed economy, but perhaps sometimes sees it as something that, that is. Um, I look at the ways in which the mixed economy is an, as you said, Elena, an ongoing site of contestation. And you know, the power relations are always shifting and sort of the degree of subsumption is always shifting. Um, and so thinking about how different industries um, and also different resistances to relations to those industries um, shift the dynamics and the balance of power within, within the mixed economy. Um, and as far as the degree to which it's a term that can be used elsewhere, I mean, yeah, I, I think it is. I think there's there's lots of ways in which people talk about, um, you know, resistance to capital and and labors that are ambivalent to capital that sit both within it and outside of it. And, and you know, Leah writes about that so wonderfully in relation to social reproduction. And and I find that literature really wonderful and and really rich. And and to me, it's it's a global literature, but um, it's a global literature with you know very very distinct theories. And, and so the reason why I chose the term mixed economy um, is because it has this regional history. And so I didn't want to assume that the non-capitalist relations of um, the North could be talked about in the same way that we talk about non-capitalist relations elsewhere. Great question, great answer. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, I, I want to begin to close <laughs> by with, with um, a thank you that I meant to make at the outset, which is to the Global Labor Research Center, to Lohan uh, Good, Good Gingrich and Hajar Mirwala for um, organizing the event and for all the work that they do in um, making such events happen. So thank you very, very much for today. Um, it's, it's uh, much appreciated to have this institution here at York University virtually and um, also thankfully today in person. Um, thank you to the audience um, here in the basement of Atkinson College in the wrong room with um, multiple laptops, which clearly can solve a problem. Um, and, and thank you so much to Rebecca for making the trek to uh, back to Toronto to her alma mater um, and to Veldin for such thoughtful comments. And what a great audience. I mean, what, what, what yeah. can you say? Yeah. So um, thank you all for attending and for your um, wonderful feedback about the book. I urge you all to, where may I have it please? Oh yes. To buy the book. It's a great book and look at this <laughs> cover. It's a beautiful <laughs> cover. Um, as I think Hazar has put up in the chat, it's 25% off if you use the code HALL25. So all you have to remember is Hall and 25, and you will get the book for 25% off. Um, and so I would urge you to buy the book, read the book, uh, mention it to your friends and colleagues. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful book and uh, congratulations. So thanks everybody. I think we will close. I know there are some notes in the comments to to uh, Rebecca, and maybe what we'll do is we'll copy them, and you'll be able to yeah. you'll be able to yeah. respond to them. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, and to the parents in the in, in the back room. Okay, <laughs> friends and relatives. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye all. Oh, should I turn it off? <laughs>